Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, uh, for this talk, I, I combined uh, mainly two studies uh, which were performed in my group over the last couple of years. So the overall idea of the talk is to give you a little bit of background where we are coming from. And as you heard, I'm a physicist, so some older physicists start to get interested in consciousness and religious. Uh, that's mainly after they have finished their, uh, when they come to retirement. But I started to get interested even before retirement. And uh, so I want to give you a little bit of background how we address this uh, question. And especially with uh, 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 recording brain responses in the fetal life. So at the beginning, I will tell you our background and how we assess uh, uh, fetal brain activations. And in the second part, I will give you a little bit of uh, uh, ideas how we want to address maybe also conscious processing in fetal life. And uh, that's my overall game, uh, aim of the talk today. So let me start. Uh, in 2016, we started an EU project um, which was named Luminos. And uh, the vision of the project was consciousness will someday be electromagnetically measured and altered. Likewise, the associated needed insights will prove crucial for the development of cognitive sciences. So this was the vision of the project. And uh, the questions were, what is consciousness? Can it be measured? Can it be altered through electromagnetic brain stimulation? I assume that you already heard a lot about electromagnetic brain stimulation and its relation to uh, uh, consciousness, so I will not go into this. And one of the starting points was, okay, how how do we address consciousness? And uh, we had a this kind of two-dimensional uh, definition, including wakefulness and awareness, and you see everything is, uh, uh, and uh, several projects were uh, related to minimally conscious states, or at this time, uh, the other one was called vegetative state, and how can you measure consciousness and maybe also alter it uh, in the case. But there was also some additional areas, and you see it somehow somehow way apart and included it included the fetus, the animal and the machine. So <laughs> I always thought it's a very funny thing that we are located uh, with our fetal research um, in the animal and machine area. But I think at the end of the project, we also came back uh, that uh, there is something interesting also in the fetal life related to consciousness. So at the beginning, I just want to tell you, the fetus is not a preterm. And everything what we can do in preterm is certainly different so, to what we can redo, in, uh, what we can do or uh, uh, decipher from the fetal life because the environment is completely different. The sensory stimulation is completely different. The interaction with humans is completely different. So preterm uh, investigations are certainly very interesting, but they, are, they do not really tell us a lot about the fetal uh, um, lay, life and brain development. So what did we know when we started out? Or it's uh, already uh, known for a long time uh, concerning fetal learning. Because at the beginning, uh, up to the 60s or something like this, it was, it was assumed, OK, so, uh, the newborn uh, that is when things are starting and when things are getting interesting. The fetal life is a sedated state and it doesn't really, it's, it's not really important what is happening during this uh, phase. Besides, if, if there are uh, um, certain uh, specific effects like alcohol or uh, drugs or something like this, they may interact with the development of the fetus, but otherwise it's not so really important. But in the 80s, Casper uh, and Fiber showed that uh, newborns react specifically to the voice of their mother. And because they were certainly rim limited by assessing the response of the, uh, 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 of the newborns, they, at this time, they often used a pacifier 
and uh, uh, that determines the knuckle, fre knuckle frequency as an outcome measure. Hepper and Lacan, 88, they showed a soap addiction. So they showed that mothers who watched uh, this uh, uh, TV, uh, TV serial uh, Friends and they uh, heard uh, this uh, introductionary music compared to mothers which did not watch this movie, that the, the offspring reacted more actively to this uh, uh, music of the uh, serial. And there was also, so this was more in the auditory field, but there was also a different field, so olfactory field, and Charles and Augur showed 92 that newborns re specifically react to coming with the mother's aid, which the mother ate over 12 weeks before delivery. So this was somehow the starting point uh, where we were coming from. And uh, we asked the question, okay, what is really the background? What can we base our research about fetal development? What can we uh, base it on? And uh, if you go back really uh, uh, to the uh, very intriguing work of uh, Ramon Ijal, and he already showed in his, um, uh, in his nice anatomical investigation that the fetal brain in the last trimester has all types of neurons which you also find in the adult in the adult uh, uh, brain in addition Huttenlocher, he showed and you see it marked uh, by the red arrows at the uh, 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 the uh, birth uh, the birth but even before as you see at the 28 weeks that there are a, a reasonable amount of synapses in specific areas of the brain. Uh, here is displayed the visual cortex and uh, uh, some somatosensory cortex. And what you certainly see is that there is a highly dynamic uh, uh, pruning of uh, synapses after, uh, after birth, but uh, you have already established synapses before birth during gestation. And a seminal work by Kostovic showed that uh, around the 24 to the 26 weeks, the thalamocortical connections are already established in the fetal brain. So around 24 weeks, we have a brain which is functional from the thalamo thalamus to the cortical sheet and also the sensory organs are established. So in general, this allows to assume that the, fun that the brain is functional and can detect also sensory stimulation or perceive sensory stimulation uh, starting around 24 weeks because everything from the structure is in place. But we have to see, okay, how can we really assess the fetal brain development? And uh, how we assess the fetal brain development is by brain imaging. And what you see here is a so-called squid array for reproductive assessment. It's a magnetoencephalographic device. And let me, so on the left, uh, you see the, the magnetic, uh, 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 the magnetoencephalographic device. And in this shelf, there are 156 uh, sensors these are superconducting quantum interference devices measuring magnetic, fi uh, magnetic fields. And uh, you see this looks like a little bit like a rocket, but it's a cryostat because to record the tiny fields generated also in the fetal or the human brain, you need to cool the, uh, the sensors with liquid helium. And so this is a cryostat filled with liquid helium. And the device is also installed <coughs> in a so-called magnetically shielded room. So, and what is the background? What is uh, uh, the method we are using? So we have sensors which are twisted over this whole shell. Beneath the shell, the squid sensors are located and measuring the, uh, the magnetic signals generated in the maternal abdomen. So in one way, we can measure pregnant women 
positioned over this uh, field MEG device. And what you also see here, we are also able to stimulate <coughs> so, so, so feeders, for example, by auditory stimulus, stimuli delivered to an air-filled balloon. And in addition, we are also able to record uh, newborns, which are positioned uh, by a cradle, which is attached to the FMEG system, and the fetal head is positioned over the sensor array. So this way, we, are, we, we should be able to record fetal brain signals. However, as you can imagine, uh, there may be some caveats to assess really the fetal brain. And this is shown here in this uh, uh, picture. And before going into detail, so the fetal brain signals are in the range of so-called femtotesla. That's 10 to the minus 15 tesla. That's 1 billion smaller than the Earth's magnetic field. And uh, for example, a screwdriver, an enormous screwdriver in five meters distance, which you uh, uh, just move, generates a magnetic field, which is one million times higher than the fetal brain signal. But what you see on this slide is how this is the raw recording <coughs> we get. This is an overlay of all these 156 channels. And you see the largest signal here. This is extracted from this uh, uh, raw data. And on this graph, you see the distribution of the field. And certainly you can imagine what the uh, uh, signal is, is uh, which generating this. And it's the maternal heart. And you see the strength of the maternal heart is in the range of several, uh, several tens of picotesla. Picotesla is 10 to the minus 12. So a factor at least 1,000 to 10,000 larger than the fetal brain signal. What we are doing is we extract the, uh, the maternal heart signal. Then we investigate the leftover. And you see here again a rather large signal, which you see here the average. And this is the, uh, the fetal heart. And you also see on this topographic bl uh, plot of the, the, of the field that it shows a so-called dipolar structure indicating that the generating current is in the middle between this dipolar structure. After attenuation of the fetal heart signal, we have a leftover. And then the, the major question is, OK, is this just noise or is it some useful signal we can work on. <coughs> and what you see here is an example of an event-related response at time point zero of the fetus. And what you clearly see is a response showing a, a waveform similar to what you know from newborns or preterms to the response of auditory stimulation. This is one evidence uh, that we really record fetal brain signals, but we also did a lot of uh, studies to show, for example, that the signal we are recording and we are uh, taking into account as fetal brain signals are really generated in the brain. So we combined 3D ultrasound and did source localization and showed that the signal which we are detecting is generated in the fetal brain. But keep in mind, the so fetal head, based on the distance between the fetal head and the sensors, we cannot differentiate different brain areas or something like this. For us, the fetal brain is mainly a, 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 mainly a point source. This is certainly a limitation, but fetal MEG is the only method currently available to record electrical activity by its magnetic counterpart from the fetal head, uh, from the fetal brain. Okay, so in the beginning we showed, okay, what is the perception of, uh, 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 of auditory stimuli? And what you see here is uh, uh, what we extracted was the latency of the event-related responses and in circles, you see the fetal responses, and in squares, you see the neonatal responses. 
And what you see is, first of all, there is a large variance, but <coughs> there is also a significant decrease in latency over gestation, which is continued also in the neonatal life. So this made our, uh, this certainly uh, posed the question, okay, if there is a, a, a auditory event related response, are there further responses which are really fundamental for our development? And so we started to investigate mismatch responses to auditory stimuli. And uh, what we have shown is, and uh, you see here uh, fetus at the 29th week and the newborn at 15th week, and you see the response of the fetus to the standard and the deviant and the subtracted waveform indicating the mismatch response for the fetus and the newborn. And so we, we are rather sure that we can detect fetal mismatch responses, which are certainly a very important uh, uh, developmental um, response even in the fetal life. And this is during the last uh, third trimester. So over the, so uh, a little bit of summary, uh, uh, which neural, neural processes are already established in fetal life. And as I showed you, auditory event related responses can be recorded starting around 24th week of gestation and the latency decreases over gestation. And fetuses show mismatch-like responses to auditory stimulation in the last trimester of gestation. And we also found that the fetal behavioral state influences the event-related responses. Uh, fetal behavioral state, uh, just to give you an idea about it, uh, in general, if you talk about uh, adults or also newborns, what you normally classify is different states by recording brain signals and electro-oculography uh, uh, and heart rate, which is not doable or, or was not doable in the, in the fetus. And so people, based on work by Nihus, they developed categorization of fetal behavioral states, mainly by ultrasound recording and fetal heart rate recording. And so they classified four different fetal states like active and quiet and uh, uh, active and quiet, asleep and awake. So there were four different states and these states could also be detected with fetal biomagnetism where we mainly uh, use fetal heart rate and uh, estimation of fetal uh, movements. I will, uh, this is something important for to remember. Okay, so as I told you at the beginning, uh, we were included in this uh, Luminous project and we had to think about, okay, how, <laughs> uh, we are in a project about conscious processing. So uh, how, how, how do we address this problem? And um, because some of the uh, group members use the local global oddball paradigm to assess conscious processing in, in adults, we were thinking, okay, why not use this uh, uh, oddball, local global oddball paradigm? And the idea behind this, that the maintenance of global rule, and I will explain it later, later what the global rule is, requires some form of conscious processing. This is mainly related certainly to memory processing. And it was already used as a correlate of consciousness in different scenarios. And uh, uh, because as you see in just a minute uh, that we are talking about the global mismatch, uh, um, uh, this could be an indicator for the ability to maintain a global rule. And one of the uh, previous studies was uh, published 2014 by Basira et al. And they performed the EEG study in three months old children where they used um, sounds, uh, 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 always quadruples of sounds like you see here, A, 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 E, and 
they combined it also with uh, uh, with a video showing the same uh, uh, pronunciation. Certainly, we cannot do it in the fetus because uh, we cannot really uh, uh, present um, this kind of pictures to the fetus during uh, when he when he's still in the abdomen. And they showed at uh, three months old children that uh, they can perform the memory trace for the global rule. So our question was, okay, is this also transferable to the fetus? And so just take into account, okay, what is really the hierarchical rule learning, the local global paradigm? We have a sensory input and we have in the first order step, we have a local rule. And in the second order step, we have a global rule. How does this look like? The study design is that we have a learning phase where we present quadruples of, for example, four different equal auditory stimuli. And then we have a testing phase where we present the same stimulus or a stimulus sequence which shows a deviant at the last position. And what you clearly see is that this is a local deviant because it's uh, uh, following the three identical uh, auditory stimuli. However, it is also a global deviant because it was not learned in the learning phase. So this is a global deviant and a local deviant. And the local deviant is what you would call in the regular uh, studies a mismatch, deviant, a mismatch response, and the global deviant would indicate the response to uh, global rule learning. And you can also investigate if you have a learning phase where you use uh, uh, three identical codes and the local uh, deviant as a standard, and then there would be the global deviant would be the sequence with four identical uh, tones. So this is the approach about uh, uh, addressing uh, the conscious processing. And the tones are, uh, are uh, sequences of 500 and 700, uh, 750 hertz tones. The frequency of the tones is, uh, uh, is a result of the attenuation property of the abdomen, which filters high frequency, um, which filters high frequency components above one kilohertz very effic uh, efficiently. The so tone duration was 200 milliseconds, the intertone interval 400, sequence duration 2000 milliseconds, and intersequence interval 1700 milliseconds. The so question we addressed in the first study was, are newborns in the first weeks of, li of life able to process uh, uh, the input of uh, uh, so complex auditory input containing first or second order regularities. Um, and if yes, is there impact of infant behavioral state? So in, we investigated, uh, um, and uh, this study, I think uh, uh, I have not seen it. Uh, first, let me go back. Uh, okay, I forgot to mention it. There was this uh, screen picture on it. Uh, this was the PhD work of Julia Amosa you see on this page. And the study population were 33 infants, and they were aged between 13 and, uh, and 60, uh, roughly 60 days. And the first thing what we were able to show is that the newborns respond to the local rule. So this was expected because we already have shown that uh, the mismatch response is even visible in the fetal phase, so it also should be uh, recorded in the in the uh, newborn phase. The more interesting question was, is there also a difference between the global deviants and the global standards? And what you see here is uh, exploratory analysis of this data. And what you see here is the response to the global deviant, so the, the last uh, uh, tone, which is in the depend, which is showing the, uh, whether it's a global deviant or a global standard. And what you see here is that we have two different time windows, a very early after tone delivery around 80 to uh, 80 milliseconds and the later one around 600 uh, milliseconds. 
And uh, so we see significant differences between the global deviant and the global standard. So we ask the question, okay, may this also be uh, related to the behavioral state? And what we did was uh, we determined the heart rate variability as a proxy for um, as a proxy for fee, uh, for a newborn uh, behavioral state, and uh, we had uh, newborns with ho lower heart rate variability, middle heart rate, and higher heart rate variability. And what you see on the on the right side is that there is a significant difference in the amplitude where fetuses with a high heart rate variability showed increased activity uh, in the event related response, but also increased power over nearly the whole frequency band. And what we found is that the global rule response in the early time window was not affected by state. It just showed uh, that the global deviant was different to the other ones. However, for the late response around 720, 745 milliseconds, we see that the, uh, the newborns with a high heart rate variability show a strong response to the global rule violation. Versus, uh, besides, with the low heart rate variability, there is no difference in the response. So it seems that the behavioral state of the newborns also affects the detection of, um, uh, of the global rule relation. So, taken together, newborns show signs for learning of first and second order regularities. Second order learning ability is modulated by behavioral state. So let's go on and ask the question, is the fetal brain in the last trimester, into pre in the last trimester of pregnancy able to process complex auditory input containing first and second order regularity? And if yes, how does this ability develop over the course of gestation? And we had 60 fetuses recorded, 56 were included, and at the end of the day, we could include 121 uh, uh, data sets with a uh, valid brain, uh, brain location. So you see this kind of studies, you have a lot of uh, also of uh, um, also of recordings you cannot use because you cannot detect the fetal brain and all these kind of problems because uh, based on our low signal to noise ratio. And here you see an example of uh, the auditory event related brain responses. Do you, uh, during one of the uh, uh, stimulation with the four tones, and we extracted uh, from the 156 channels, 10 channels representing the brain activity, and uh, we determined the RMS of the, those channels uh, for detection. And interestingly, we found that the fetuses respond with the increased activation to the global deviant compared to the global standard. So this indicates that also, also the feeder shows a response to the global rule. And <clears throat> if we measure by a median split uh, uh, the heart rate variability, we can differentiate uh, fetuses with a high heart rate variability compared to a, uh, to a low heart rate variability. And these states are somehow associated or they call it quiet sleep and active sleep, where there's still a lot of discussion going on what is really sleep in the fetus and how can it be determined. But that's a classification which is uh, determined and you also see that the fetal state says also active awake state. So, what is shown here, the major finding was that, again, similar to the newborns, the fetuses in the, with a the high heart rate variability showed the response to the global deviant, uh, to a, uh, showed a higher response to the global deviant compared to global standards, which is not visible in the low heart rate variability. And what you also see on this uh, uh, graph, we also see that 
especially in the very late gestational age, around 35 to 40 weeks of gestation, you see this difference between the global deviant and the global standard. So it seems that at least during the very last time of, uh, um, of pregnancy, there are signs of this global rule learning, which are also modulated by uh, behavioral state. So, so the conclusion of this uh, uh, study was that fetuses show signs for learning of second order rules, rule learning ability is modulated by behavioral state, and ability develops over the course of gestation, and it may be an indication for the development of conscious processing. So now the, now the, uh, the, the study could be over, but we had a very interesting uh, new person joining our group. This was uh, Joel Fröhlich. And uh, we started discussing, okay, maybe we can even get more information out of this uh, protocol. And uh, so, we were so we were discussing, okay, there is one approach to, um, to classify conscious by perturbations. You know, the uh, perturbation complex, uh, complexity index is something used. But as you know, for the perturbation and complexity index, they use a TMS simulation. And we thought it may not be the best idea to use TMS in newborns or even in fetuses. So we discussed maybe we can also use sensory stimulation, which results in cortical or cortical interactions, and we just measure <coughs> sorry, and we just measure the EEG MEG signals and determine the complexity by lambda sif or uh, similar approaches and get an estimate of the sensory perturbational computation uh, complexity index and have something where we can estimate the level of consciousness. Uh, please take into account that for the fetal recording and also for the newborn recording, we normally only have a, te a temporal, not a spatial temporal response to the perturbation. So as uh, would be needed for really for the perturbational complexity index. So as you probably also know, there is also a zoo full with entropy measures. On the left side, <coughs> you see approaches by signal complexity, where you have, uh, for example, the lamp and sift or context-free uh, tree weighting uh, um, approaches, which require binarization of the signal and determine the compressibility of the binary sequence, or for example, the permutation entropy, where you are searching for motifs and determine the frequency of the, of the motif uh, uh, occurrence. But I will not go into detail into about the different entropy measures. In, in general, just take into account they measure something like complexity. Uh, so we use the data which were recorded during uh, uh, during the um, uh, during the experiment designed by Julia Moser, and we used the three thousand uh, three thousand two hundred milliseconds, including the event related responses to all stimuli, starting two hundred milliseconds before and three thousand milliseconds after the st uh, stimulation of the first one. Um, and it's also important that we normalized uh, 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 the amplitude to account for differences in head size and position. So our, our hypothesis, as most people certainly would assume, was that there would be an increase in complexity or entropy over the maturation, which continues for the, also in the newborn period. However, what we found was that the entropy 
was decreasing for the fetuses and for the new newborns. And in addition, <coughs> the decrease was larger for the male compared to, fe to female, which nearly showed no decrease, and also for the newborn period. So that was really an astonishing a finding that we have decrease of, uh, uh, of this, what we call sensory perturbation, uh, perturbation complexity index. And, uh, but is it maybe there is additional information where we have uh, also uh, data except, uh, also supporting? Uh, uh, in, in my group, I also worked with a group in Little Rock where I started the fetal. We were able to show that uh, uh, visually evoked responses are more easily detectable in, fetus, in, in male fetuses. So, she, so they show uh, increased detection rate in the, in the female, in the male compared to the female, and the undetected way, uh, where we, uh, uh, in the visual response, which was highly, which was significant at, uh, and at the trend level also for the auditory event-related responses. So there seems already, and this is a very interesting finding supporting this, um, that there is a, also a, a sex difference or also during the fetal phase. So what's really going on? Uh, and then we ask the question, Okay, does the entropy decrease as auditory, uh, as auditory evoked amplitude increases with maturation? So how is the, imp uh, the input, uh, how is the, the importance of uh, the amplitude change? And here you see just the examples, the playing examples of high entropy, intermediate entropy, low entropy of the auditory response. And what we determined was because we can calculate this uh, um, complexity measures either by separating the contribution of the amplitude versus the comp contrib uh, contribution, for example, of um, phases and uh, temporal parameters. And the important thing is shown here that the decrease of, you see here, and in this uh, 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 lightly green, the decrease over gestation is mainly driven by the change in the amplitude, whereas an increase over gestation is mainly driven by the non-amplitude parts. And uh, so the non-amplitude properties like signal phase or phase times amplitude interaction drive increases in entropy with maturation. This may be something if we would investigate not, uh, for example, the spontaneous activity, we would find also increase. So keep in mind that we have shown that uh, uh, event-related response complexity decreases over gestation. So what, what is really the interpretation of it? And the interpretation is, as I have shown you with the uh, Example by, uh, by Huttenlocher that there is a, the synapses they are building up during the uh, developmental process. Uh, it may be that the shaping of the event related responses leads, uh, leads to a reduction of the noise contributing to the, uh, contributing to the event related responses, leading to a decrease in complexity during gestation. So, in conclusion, fetuses and newborns show a decrease in entropy over age. Male fetuses show a larger decrease compared to female fetuses. The decline in neural entropy is driven by amplitude changes. Changes in signal phase, which drives entropy increases, at which drives entropy increases, might be related to consciousness, more related to consciousness. And um, future experiments that can resolve temporospatial response patterns may still be able to use sensory perturbation, the complexity inter, uh, info, uh, uh, index to inter, uh, in fear perinatal consciousness. So 
that was my last slide and thank you and I want to thank especially Joel Fröhlich and Julia Moser who have done most of the work for this talk. Thank you very much.